Okay. Good morning. Welcome to episode two of Wither the Luniversity. I am Adam Elwanger, and I'm excited today to be talking with John Stadden, who is James B. Duke Professor of Psychology, um, now Professor Emeritus at Duke University. Thank you, John, for doing this. Happy to be here. So uh, you have been in higher education probably since uh, I would guess right around 1960 or before. So I'm excited to talk to you about the changes that we've seen in, in the university over those 60 years or so. Um, you've also got a brand new book coming out from Regnery uh, in about a week um, called Science in an Age of Unreason. And I wanna talk to you a little bit about that too. Um, so to start, I wonder if you could tell us about your training. I mean, um, where did you uh, do um, your studies uh, and, and sort of tell us a little bit about what your research has focused on sort of over the course of your career in, in just a, a, um, a broad sense? Okay, I'm happy to do that. Um, those who are really, really interested can read my uh, memoir called The Englishman which is, was published by the University of Buckingham Press a few years ago. Anyway, the, the bottom line is I grew up in London, in England. Um, went to college at the university. Well, initially I went to something called Battersea Polytechnic, which I think no longer exists by that name. It's become a university in engineering. And I went in in engineering because in the grammar school arrangements of those times, you had to decide when you were 16, whether you would go into arts or science. And in fact, uh, my, my headmaster was rather a wonderful old guy called P.A. Wayne, uh, pushed me into arts because apparently I had a good vocabulary or something, but I really wanted to do science. So belatedly, I came into science, I switched over. And because I, I was in science, there are a limited number of things to which I could apply at the university and engineering was probably the easiest to get into when you get right down to it. So there I wound up in Battersea Polytechnic, um, where I was surrounded by people, most of whom were much better at engineering than I was, including two young women in the very small group that we were in there, only two women, a Polish lady and an Indian lady, very gifted they were, more so than me. So, so I wandered around and I found that there was something called University College, which had something called psychology in it. And psychology didn't require A-levels, this is, a, you know, 18... 17, 18 year old exam, you have to pass with some distinction to get into university. They didn't require it because nobody taught psychology in school. So they had to rely on tests. It turned out I was quite good at tests. So I got into this and I found, lo and behold, you could do almost anything. There were a lot of girls there. It had many, many educational advantages. I can say that. So there I was. Uh, I don't know how, how boring this is going to be, but I was there for two years. I made all sorts of mistakes. Uh, and barely survived the second year. But I love the British system because the British system, unlike the American system, doesn't test you all the time. I mean, uh, as long as you can cram a couple of weeks at the end of the year and pass that big exam, you're okay. It's a bit more complicated than that, but that is a big difference between the British system as it was then, and I su suspect largely is now. That's the big difference between the British system and the American system. I would have flunked out of an American college, no question. Anyway, after two years, um, by a complicated series of things, I dropped out. I went to Africa for two years, which is not as adventurous as it sounds. My parents were already there. And I came back and then got serious for a year and uh, went to America, but wound up eventually at Harvard in sort of grand old days when the experiment, the psychology department was really experimental psychology and all the rest of psychology was called social relations, was in another building. We were in the uh, a wonderful basement of Memorial Hall, which is a hundred and some rooms or for half a dozen faculty. It wasn't, there weren't, weren't very many faculty. George von Baker, she was there. Some people may have heard of him. He got a Nobel Prize for his work on hearing and so on. So it was very hard science, experimental psychology. Uh, and uh, the, in a way, the most lively group there was one that had been started by B.S. Skinner, the opera and conditioning guy. 
Uh, and Richard Hanstein, who at that time, I assure you, was not at all interested in individual differences or IQ or anything like that. Anyway, I worked in the operant lab, which was, I thought, a wonderful, uh, a wonderful setup. You, you did experiments with individual organisms, you didn't need statistics, and so on and so on. Uh, anyway, I graduated from there. I taught for three years in the University of Toronto, which is a great university. Uh, but it was very cold there. Um, the winter was very long. Um, and some of the Canadians were rather reactive. I felt they were always saying to me, we're not American, we're not American. And I would say, <laughs> not quite as vigorously, I don't care, I don't care. And so by various circuitous routes, I wound up after three years at Duke University where I've been ever since, but for sabbaticals in Brazil and uh, England and other places. Um, so that's, that's my history, but, but intellectually, my history is really of experiments. I, my work was experimental, and uh, that's the way you really prove causes and so on. I never used statistics. I didn't think I did a between group study in my life, and I don't, of course, now a lot of them are turning out to be false and so on. Uh, so I'm happy for that. But that's my orientation. Um, my appointment is in psychology and also in biology. And in, indeed, if the British educational system had permitted it, I probably would have gone into biology. But uh, that wasn't possible at that time. Um, anyway, so there it is. Now, Adam, you asked about the changes I've seen. Well, it's, it's, it's a very strange thing for me. I mean, I can talk about my uh, personal experience. As I say, I've taught at Duke from 1967 until I retired in 2007. So that's you know, 40 years, right? Um, and up until the time I retired, I noticed very, very few changes. Um, there were always people saying ridiculous things <laughs> about gender and race and so on. I mean, in fact, in the 90s, I, early 90s, I edited something called the Faculty Newsletter, which was a, a vain attempt to get faculty to communicate with one another across disciplines. It never worked. I and mean, it was quite striking how poorly it worked. Uh, for instance, a colleague of mine, uh, a biological anthropologist, wrote an article critical of one of these postmodernist uh, people. The postmodernist lady is still famous, I think. Um, uh, but nobody would respond. I mean, they just re wouldn't respond. There's literally only one person in the sort of postmodernist literary, uh, cutting edge uh, group in English who was willing to respond. So that. that but you know, we, it wasn't worrisome. It wasn't worrisome because what they were saying it seemed so utterly ridiculous. How could anybody take it seriously? Uh, so it didn't really affect me at all. Uh, then I, I was off teaching for some years with fellowships and so on. And then the last three years of my career there, I was teaching. And I did notice some small changes. I couldn't really tell. I taught uh, an undergraduate freshman seminar and the students there were okay. I mean, I got along fine with them, but one, one or two of them were difficult. I remember I had a very, uh, very strange experience with a, a black kid who uh, got a score. You know, my method, which is the British method, I'm sure a lot of people use it, is to give numerical scores and then somewhat uh, uh, by curve allocate their grade, you know, the letter, the letter grade. And he got, I think, 74 or something on his essay. And he was absolutely shocked. He was obviously a good student, you know, and so on. In fact, in, in the final thing, he got an A or an A minus. Uh, but he simply could not grasp uh, the fact that his score or his essay was an A quality for an 18 year old kid, but was not 100%, which you would expect from an adult. I mean, the, he didn't understand the difference in a relative, the difference between a relative and an absolute. Uh, scale. That's all I can remember from those last years of teaching. And then I quit. I was seven. I shut down the lab um, because I was spending more and more time on writing grant proposals. It's now a chronic issue. You can literally you can spend more time writing these semi-fictional uh, exercises than actually doing the research, which is kind of obviously ridiculous. Anyway, so I quit and had very little to do with the university. I did some writing and some of general issues. Um, but I, I, I didn't do, I have much to do with UNC at all. But a shock occurred in the summer of 2020. You may remember certain events occurred in 2020. And what happened, I recounted this in, in uh, blogs, various blogs, 
Yeah, what happened was I was on an email list, the general department email list. So I knew about the faculty meetings and so on. And one day, I, I think it was July, I forget the exact date, came this email from the chair of the department, who I knew had known as an undergraduate, bright guy in a hard science area. He wasn't a clinician or something. But he sent this email out, inviting us all to sign on to a petition for something called Shutdown STEM, which I don't know if you remember it. So Shutdown STEM was the, uh, somehow uh, in response to the George Floyd business, to, which had been reacted to, of course, in the absence of any attention to the actual statistics and so on. So it was a purely emotional reaction uh, to the uh, killing of this guy who was by no means um, a saint, as we would now know. Anyway, uh, so he sent this around, inviting the whole department to sign on to this, um, to this uh, memo. And I read, I thought, why is this a, a university issue? Certainly, why is it a collective issue? Individuals are free to do whatever they want, you know. But why is, why is the department being invited as a collective to get into this? Now, a big part of this petition was all about systemic racism. I think in the first few paragraphs, systemic racism occurred four times, three or four times. And I had, in fact, written a critique of systemic racism. I can't remember where it came out. Um, Colette or somewhere, or yeah. uh, Martin Center. Anyway, I'd written this critique of uh, systemic racism, which is a pretty much a, a fallacious notion as, it, uh, as it's used anyway. So I wrote a one sentence uh, reply or um, response to this memo, which went something like, um, if there was a dissent column, I would be inclined to sign it. And then I gave a link to my systemic racism too. Well, that caused a riot, it turns out. <laughs> I, was, I was amazed, you know, people really were upset about it and so on. I also got three or four favorable emails, one of which said, please don't use my Duke email. In other words, he was afraid of being, you know, outed as someone who, who agreed with me. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. It was just literally unbelievable to me that in an academic environment, people are afraid to dissent from something which doesn't even belong in that environment anyway. Anyway, that's that's sort of my history, but that's really the point where I saw that there'd be a huge, huge change. And these people that uh, 10 or 20 years previously, I thought were just lunatics, you know, I mean, they were just living in a world of words, you know, and unconnected with reality, these literary types, postmodern type. And in fact, that their ideas have become enormously influential. Enormously influential. I mean, obviously George Floyd didn't start all this. He just lit the uh, lit the match. You know, <laughs> these these sentiments were already um, in place and uh, just willing to be animated. Anyway, Adam, I'll what, stop talking. What do you make of it? I mean, why why would the faculty get so upset by someone who had been emeritus for thirteen years and and away from 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 the university almost entirely like why is, why would they react so viscerally to, to I that? that is a, that's an excellent question i mean that's what shocks me about all of these things people can say things which uh 20 or 30 years ago would have been just you know this is just a fact i agree with it i disagree with it but now you know it's it's uh, um uh, hand wringing and tears i mean it's quite extraordinary so i literally don't know i did get uh, I, I did one of the faculty, a uh, new faculty, and most of the faculty had turned over, of course, in these 14, 15 years. So this chap was new. He did try and uh, um, have an intellectual debate, but it was so sort of from an, on high and, uh, and I know the truth and so on. So it was very, it wasn't a real debate in, in any way. And other faculty, including a, a lady whose lab I had been uh, next to for many years, or his lab had been next to mine for many years, you know, called me a racist and all the rest of it. I mean, it's just incredible. So I, I, it, it looked to me like, um, you know, as some um, sinister compound had been released into the air. <laughs> so you've, you've had another incident recently, I think, on the message board for faculty of the American Psychological Association. Oh, <laughs> yeah, and that was funny. Yeah. So... Uh, 
I think just for our, our listeners, um, what this is, is, is kind of just a chat board, right? Where professors Absolutely. in the discipline can talk to one another. That's cool. um, and uh, I, I guess that there was some conversation about the, the question of gender, which seems like one of the three topics that we talk about anymore. Um, and uh, I think your quote was, hmm, binary view of sex false? what is the evidence? Is there a Z chromosome? Um, and so I think you're alluding here to the fact that there are X chromosomes, Y chromosomes. Um, <laughs> there are two gametes. Uh, there are two sexes. Uh, and tell us a little bit about the backlash to this uh, very factual, uh, brief comment that you made. <laughs> Well, yeah, um, uh, uh, I'm shocked, of course, to hear those, those statements. Uh, I, well, this is a, a, a message board for comparative psychology, psychology of animals, which is what I do. All my experimental subjects are rats, pigeons, um, lemurs, you know, and so on. I've done a handful of human experiments, but mostly it's with, with animals. So I, I kept up with this group. And apparently I'd, I'd ticked them off previously, although I don't really know why, because I communicated with it very, very infrequently. And just really. But what got me on this occasion was they, there were some, there were two things. One was there was some discussion of gender identity in animals. And I thought that was a curious concept to say the least. <laughs> um, uh, and you know, I felt for the animals. Anyway, um, that was, was one thing. The other thing was this idea of non-binary sex, and that's what got me to write that rather snarky comment. And apparently, it really upset them. I mean, <laughs> I thought I thought I was just being flippant, and you know, they could take it or leave it. But no, they couldn't take it or leave it. So anyway, apparently, the leaders of this of this uh, uh, thread, or whatever it's called, this um, message board, there were not one, not two, but three of them. Three of them. They all got together. And they said, we're going to take you off the message board, and which I said, well, you know, I'll go away and cry, you know. I mean, it was ridiculous. <laughs> anyway, that happened, and it was so sort of ridiculous. I sent it to uh, a friend at the National Association of Scholars, just uh, it was so funny, and it's ridiculous. And he said, well, can, can, can we publicize this? I said, well, sure, if you want to. <laughs> and, and, and so we did, and I got written up in Newsweek and so on and so on. I mean, because it was so utterly ridiculous. But, but just to be clear, they did kick you off, right? Oh, yeah, they did kick me off. They didn't, they didn't want to hear it. They didn't want to, even though I, if I sent a message to that message board once every two months, that would be a high, a high estimate. I think but, that uh, what that's about, I mean, it's just raw power. That's all it is, is it, it's, you know, um, I think that they they have to feel like they they have that power to arbitrate the terms of the discourse. Um, without that, you know, then then they get they get pushed into the realm of debate. And for there even to be a debate about some of these things implies that they might not might not be correct about some of these things. Um, and I think for them that's just wholly intolerable. That can cannot be. Well, absolutely. I mean, they're like religious fanatics. There's no question about it. Like religious fanatics. I mean, it's like going up to a, 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 a Trinitarian or whatever they are and say, well, no, they're not three gods. There's really only two and a half. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, it's going to get very upset, right? So <laughs> that's the way these guys react. I and mean, this one guy who tried to debate me about the, uh, the shutdown STEM business, he, that was the way he operated. Well, well, we start from this position, and I say, "Well, that position is nonsense." You know, <laughs> oh no, no, we have to start from. It. So it's it was it was rather humorous. I mean, I've been lucky in a way. I mean, all of these occasions, these things have been all, all more humorous than threatening. I mean, I'm, I'm you know emeritus. Nobody's tried to take me off the Duke website yet. Well, I suppose they could. <laughs> um, so let me ask you this, and this is uh, something I think about a lot. If if this was the university you entered in 1967, if this was the context in 1967 when you were a young man, would this have been something that you even signed on for? Would you even have pursued um, an academic career, do you think? Well, they wouldn't have hired me for a starter. 
<laughs> obviously. But no, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely contrary to the whole idea of the university. And one of the themes of my, my book, you know, is you've got to be able to separate fact from passion. And you've got to be able to look at data without getting uh, into a rage about it. You, once you establish that it's true, well, then maybe a rage is legitimate, but not before you understand whether it's true or not. But now the emotion comes first. That is a very, very little question. So, and you might not have a, a answer that you like to this question, but I feel like I have to ask it. I'm 43 years old. I'm a full professor of English. And I've watched the university change in the, what, uh, 20 years since I started my undergraduate work. And I wonder, you know, like, do I have 30 more years of this in me, right? Uh, do I, if this is the, the, the terms of, of doing academic work, I mean, in this sort of fevered, irrational um, academic culture, um, what do younger professors who are, are disturbed by these trends, what do we do? Should we, should we leave the university? Should we, should we fight it? What's, what's to be done? Yeah, well, that is, that is of course, the, um, the overwhelming question that a lot of people, people have raised. I mean, one solution, as, as you know, these folks that... Um, at the University of Austin, they're trying to start a new university. But you have huge impediments, I mean, huge obstacles. The main one is this, um, I think the economists call it positional good problem. And once a place is at the top, it's very hard to displace it because people, students go there because it's at the top, not because they know anything about what it offers. And of course, faculty will too. I mean, Harvard gets a lot of great faculty and uh, uh, probably many of them, if not most of them, don't follow this kind of work agenda, but they go because it's Harvard. Um, yeah, so uh, in fact, we might talk a little bit more about Harvard. They've, uh, they've uh, exceeded themselves uh, recently in a project. Anyway, um, yeah, so it, it's a really, really serious problem because the these anti-intellectual, anti-science attitudes are now so ubiquitous. I mean, there's, there's a handful. I mean, that's my impression. I'm not an expert. I haven't gone out and surveyed these things. I haven't talked to them on the phone or whatever. But it's my impression there are only a handful of colleges or universities that follow the traditional model, you know, Hillsdale College, and so on. Gross, and yeah. a lot of the problem is, well, the problem is there's now a huge bureaucracy that enforces this kind of nonsense. This is a DEI or DIE, DIE, whatever you want to call it, diversity, inclusion, and equity bureaucracy, which is enormous. It's quite enormous. I mean, Duke, I don't know, has dozens of people who do what? I mean, nothing at all. They were completely unnecessary. So why is this? Well, that some political or social scientists should really look into it. I think part of the problem is the government. Title IX and these other education titles can be manipulated by people in the, uh, the bureaucracy, the Washington bureaucracy, in such a way as to intimidate um, locals into following their, uh, their wishes. And once the locals, the people at the university, um, begin to hire one or two people, and then those one or two people were influential and so on. And pretty soon they can tip the whole thing. So I th think one place maybe to start, because it'd be a lot easier than dealing with the universities, is uh, this so-called administrative state. Uh, by, in, other, in other words, political action, political action, uh, legal action, uh, if these regulators uh, get over their skis, you know, and so on. Um, so that's one tactic, I think, is to look at the way uh, the government bureaucracy is energizing this kind of uh, uh, DEI tyranny, which it is, I think, in many, many respects. Um, the second is, of course, to start independent uh, uh, institutions. And uh, you will notice, or I have noticed, <laughs> that these independent institutions eschew federal funding because federal funding begin, brings with it all of these 
all of these uh, strings. And of course, it's very tough, right, to start a university without federal funding. But beyond that, I, I am really, really not sure what, what ought to be done, but I think it's really, I hate to use this word, but it really is a systemic problem. There's no question about it. Yeah. At, at my university, like many others, people, uh, professors are fond to talk about shared governance of the university um, that where faculty have a, a role in, in governing it. You know, there's a faculty senate. It's at this point, it just seems like a laugh to me because the administration of the university is so large and, and the, the sheer numbers of people in that layer of the university so far outnumber the faculty that, uh, you know, I, I, the idea that faculty are somehow uh, driving a decision making process at the university is just absurd. Um, there's, it's, uh, I've had my many run ins with our DEI office. Um, the person who recently vacated the um, Title IX enforcer position, um, when we were interviewing her, uh, I asked her um, if someone has had multiple Title IX complaints where there has been no finding of a violation, right? So, so basically the person was exonerated. But then they get another Title IX complaint. What is the role of those previous complaints that were found to be baseless? She told me that the mere presence of the complaints adds validity to the current complaint, even though there were no findings in the previous um, investigations, which is, you know, the, the idea that somebody who thinks that is is the person um, in, in at the head of, of these efforts in the university is, I don't know a word for it except Orwellian. I mean, that's, that's what it, it certainly is. doesn't conform to the traditions of law or justice, not, not at all. I don't think that they're at, well, I think they think they're after justice. They talk a lot about social justice, but I really don't think that in getting to that sort of promised land, whatever that means in their heads, right? I, I don't think they care about how many skulls they have to crush on the way to sort of bringing about the, that uh, utopia. Well, if you're, if, you're, if you're certain you know you're right, it makes life a lot, a lot simpler, doesn't it? <laughs> so, you know, that, yeah, go ahead. How, how did all this happen? I mean, you've said that you saw it happen. 20, 2020 was kind of when the, the mask came off. Um, but how did it happen? Uh, do you remember sort of how the groundwork for this whole sort of uh, Leviathan was, yeah. was laid? Well, I, I'm just one person and I haven't done re intensive research on it. But there are a number of trends which sort of tick marks along the way, which might signify something. For example, I remember, I remember when uh, uh, student polling was uh, about teachers' effectiveness was solicited. Now, before that time, uh, there were things like Harvard had one, I forgot what it was called, but where the students rated the professors. Okay, the students rated the professors. But it was unofficial. It's completely unofficial, and I don't think the administration paid much attention to it. And in any case, they couldn't wield it as a weapon. But then uh, somehow the faculty voted to allow official um, teacher evaluation. Why? <laughs> I mean, why would the faculty agree to that? They feel guilty as they won't. Well, if it's official, it'll be a little, a little bit more accurate or what? I do not know. But of course, it was incredibly stupid because it had two things. It handed a weapon to the administration uh, for raises and so on. And it elevated the students relative to the faculty. And that's a concept which Americans have a very hard time with. But there should be a distance between the faculty and the students. Um, the student should be in a role of supplicants. They should be there to learn from the faculty. Now, obviously, the faculty must pay attention to the students, what they, what they know, what they understand, and so on. But there should be a, a distinction between those two roles. And this uh, um, uh, student evaluation of teachers was the first break in that. 
in that, in that thing. And reinforcing that was the idea of the university as a business. Uh, in, in before the Second World War, let's say, the universities did not look to expand. They were just there. I mean, certainly in England, there were just a handful of universities, Oxford and Cambridge, St. Andrews, uh, University of London, you know, maybe 10. I'm not sure there were even 10 universities. And they were not looking to expand. You know, that wasn't their role. They, everybody recognized this was an elite organization. Not everybody either wanted to come into it or, or was qualified to come into it. And that's fine. And that's the way it was. And then after the war, it all changed. The sort of hyper democracy took over. Uh, the idea that everybody's equal took over, equal intellectually, not just equal legal. Uh, you had idiots like Tony Blair. You remember him? He was our uh, British prime minister, I think, for a while. And he, in his infinite wisdom, said 50% of people should go to college. How the bloody hell does he know? How does he know how many people should go to college? Well, America, we've got that beat. Barack Obama said that every American should go to college. Right. So then it was escalated, right? It's like saying everybody should be beautiful. Uh -huh. yeah. You know, I mean, the universities have a function. So, so what I'm saying is that convergent forces have driven the university into this, uh, into this um, woke mode. And um, as soon as, well, there are other things. I mean, as soon as a lot, a, lot of, a lot of kids are going to the university, they become perceived as customers, you know, as customers, not product, and they were in a way a product, but they're customers. So you know, their wish is uh, hegemonical. <laughs> customers are always right. And put all this together, the, uh, first of all, the authority of the faculty, and now the quality of the faculty has declined. I mean, in almost every uh, department, probably in physics and so on, it's okay. But the DEI requirement means if, if you're forced to hire people according to uh, racial and uh, ethnic and gender quotas, it means statistically speaking, the quality will decline. There's no question about it. Um, the ability is not uniformly distributed across the population. I definitely yeah, so feel I like think there's these are a bunch of, of ideas of, of things that have contributed to this. I definitely feel like that shift from the, the university seeing students as students to seeing students as clients played a role here. Um, that sort of uh, satisfaction uh, are the students satisfied? I also think that there's a good bit of um, very little uh, epistemic humility on the part of young young people today. In other words, like I, I don't think that they think they have anything to learn. I think that they, they think that they've got it figured out um, and that what my job is, is to kind of put a stamp of approval on um, that, yes, yes, you're, you, you've got it figured out. All right, go ahead. Um, the credentialism also plays a role in, in this, that uh, it's become so watered down that the bachelor's degree really just doesn't mean anything anymore. I mean, there, there is no way that an outsider can reliably expect that some a holder of a bachelor's degree has any real competence in anything, not writing, not, uh, you know, um, even just sort of uh, um, communication, talking to people. Um, and I, I think that that is a, a big part of um, the product of the, the university business too, is, you know, um, people want the stamp of approval. And if you withhold it, they're unsatisfied. Um, and if they're unsatisfied, well, we better change the product. Um, hmm. So I asked you how it could be saved. And I think that you're right, that it probably has to start with the the administrative layer of the institution. Um, is it the same in Britain? I mean, are these are these trends uh, uh, sort of international or, I mean, I admit that the United States is uniquely allergic to elite institutions and any kind of hierarchy, um, but is, is it observable in the British university too? I think so. Um, well, uh, before I get it, let me give one example, a recent example, which really shocked me. 
there's a very distinguished professor here. I don't know him personally, but he's in a, a hard science molecular biology area. He's got a lot of awards and so on. He's close to retirement. Okay. Uh, and he, I don't, I don't remember exactly what he did that these people got upset about. It was something like saying we should hire by America, some, some, some bland thing like that. <laughs> and he was viciously attacked by two graduate students, graduate <laughs> students. I mean, I just was floored by that. I, I mean, a graduate student should be totally obsessed with his work, you know? How can these guys have time to indulge in wokeism? I mean, it was just amazing to me. So that's one thing. Now, the other thing about Britain, <laughs> well, this is interesting. I'm an alum of University College, and a while back, maybe six months ago, three months ago, they circulated to everybody, to all the alumni, a draft of their vision, values, and mission. I think there were three terms. Vision, values, and missions. Asking for suggestions. And it's the, there were five documents. That was the first one, mission, values. And the others were other things. The first one is 4,300 words. Right? And um, this is mission, values. Vision. Vision. 4,300 words. The word truth did not occur. <laughs> in these it did not occur okay it did not occur anyway i got so annoyed at this i wrote a long critique i'll send it to you if you're interested I am. A, long, a long critique and they, ucl had invited comments so i sent it to them <laughs> we'll see what they do with it but i mean it was it was it was you know there's a certain there's a certain specimen i, I almost think it's a human genetic variant there's a certain specimen that writes admin speak you probably noticed. Bug speak. Is there another name for it? Yeah. Well, I call it some admin speak. I'm not, there should be a name for it. And what these chaps do is they string together words like vision, excellence, uh, forward, you know, it's like a kind of bot. They string these words together and think they're writing something, and their bosses think they are too, and so they, 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 they move ahead. So this thing was full of that kind of stuff, but this kind of uh, speech is everywhere now. I mean, you're an English professor. You must get even more mad at it than I do. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, there's a lot of it even in English departments. And honestly, like I, I think that uh, in most universities, the English department is the very one of the sources of the rot. Um, you know, uh, I think in, in part um, the fact that literature obtains as as the focus of English studies it has, is um, strange in in the fact that most students don't read anymore you know uh, they, they they don't read much um, and they want their, their university clients what they want is a credential and a job Absolutely. and English is notoriously bad at positioning students um, for a job uh, and yet we insist on teaching these these things that have very little practical application. Um, I think that uh, the English departments in the United States are doing a very good job of killing themselves. Um, but uh, I, I kind of hope that um, out of the rubble, maybe something new can be built. It's just a, a question of how long it'll take until what remains is rubble. Um, and I don't know if that will be, I mean, it, it wouldn't surprise me if it's 10 years, but it also wouldn't surprise me if it's 50. Um, yeah, so know. tell us about your new book, um, Science in an Age of Unreason. It's, that's a sexy title. Okay, yeah, I'll be happy to. And then I guess we should so hang on. Okay. Just, this, is not the, this is not the cover I really wanted, but it'll, it, it will do, I guess. It's a beautiful cover. I like it. You like it? Good. Yeah. Anyway, so it's a bunch of chat, uh, sections. There are four, four sections to it. And I have to remind myself what they are. Um, the first thing, I'll just say a little bit about it. The first thing, the, uh, part of it, arose from a, a debate I had with uh, an evolutionary biologist, a fairly distinguished evolutionary biologist. And uh, but I, I didn't seek that debate. It came because I published an article, I think it was in Quillette, on the nature of religion and, uh, uh, and, and, and the relationship between religion and uh, secular things. 
Okay, so there's nothing original in what I said there. It derives from the philosopher David Hume, who was a brilliant, brilliant uh, Enlightenment Scottish philosopher, and really an amazing guy. And he pointed out that a fact, a simple fact, okay, by itself, doesn't motivate action. It, it, a fact is a fact. If a fact does motivate action, it's because you have some value, you have some value which, which tells you what to do. So if you read, for example, that uh, Kanchenjunga is a mountain that is sl slightly lower than Everest, okay? Nobody's gonna get upset about that. But if you read that um, uh, females are less good, are not as good at, at, at advanced math as a, a, a minority of men are, okay? Some cleaned up version of that. A lot of people get very upset about that. They will get very upset about that. But the first thing they should do is say, well, is it right? Is it correct or not? That's the first, that's the first thing. So then I looked at, at uh, the criticism that uh, people had made of religion and the, uh, the legal restraints that are put on religion and so on. And I, I pointed out, Again, obvious, 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 that there, there are things about religion that science has nothing to say about. If you believe in God or the Trinity or transubstantiation, uh, well, maybe not transubstantiation, but if you believe in spiritual things, they are outside science. I mean, they're matters of belief, which is fine. That's, people can believe whatever they want in theory. Uh, the second thing are historical things, um, and then science can come in if, uh, if, if you say the uh, Earth was created in 5004, BC, science can show, well, all the evidence we have says that's wrong. So that, that's wrong. So there are either science wins, or again, there are things you can't answer. How about Noah? How big was his boat? You know, and so forth. You can't answer that scientifically. Right. So that those are the domain of religion. That's fine. The third thing are moral rules, the Ten Commandments, the Golden Rule, and so on. These are rules that guide action. These are rules that guide action, and they are the only they are the only part of religion which should have any legal consequence. What you believe, unless you're a totalitarian country, what you believe is no business to the law or the government. But what you, the rules that govern your action do indeed uh, make a very great deal of difference. And then I just added, well, secularists, secular humanists also have uh, values that guide action, right? Uh, they're, they're vaguer, they're not laid down officially, you know, in the Ten Commandments kind of way, uh, but they do derive from something, often from uh, the writings of people like uh, John Rawls, uh, John Stuart Mill, and so on and so on. So they are, uh, religion and, and non-religion should be on a level legally. They should be on a level legally. Yeah. They're, it, in both cases, the, the devotees are guided by things which cannot be proved, but which they simply believe. Okay, so this consideration, this chap, <laughs> I, mean, I was really amazed. Uh, the, the, this biologist, and he wrote on his blog, you know, "This is the worst paper I've ever seen." In the left, you know, things like that, shattering, shattering, really. I had to write it. But uh, I, I, so I started the book with a, a discussion of that, and then the the first part is about philosophy and so on and so on. Related to that, can we derive these rules from science, like evolution and so on? Of course, we can't. And so, on. but that's all very philosophical stuff. Um, the rest of the book uh, are other three sections that again, I have to remind myself that I get it right. Uh, the other three se other uh, three sections are on um, <clears throat> the problems with the profession, uh, the scientific profession, the incentives. The way in which science is funded and so on. We could talk about that all. I think we'll have a separate session. Um, the third part, uh, this is a, another long story. It's to do with climate change. I have a friend who's a physicist and engineer, very enthusiastic chap. Uh, he, he's, he's quite old, but he acts very young. Anyway, he, he's been worrying about climate change for a long time, and he, he feels that the scientific data uh, do not suggest. I don't, don't point to an alarmist consequence. We're not going to have a catastrophe. And not only that, the CO2 is actually pretty good. And in fact, there is something called the CO2 coalition where people uh, exchange data about it. So I have two chapters about that. 
which derived from a, a paper I put together with this, this friend of mine, Peter Morgan. All right, so um, the fourth part, the, there are actually five parts here. The fourth part is on social science. And social science is a mess. It's a total mess. And I go into details of why it is and uh, the problem. I, I, I think we should probably end pretty soon. So I'll just say in summary, the symptom of this problem, and maybe partly the cause of this problem, is that social science, which just studies, you know, what human beings do in social situations and so on, has subdivided it into hundred, literally hundreds of divisions, hundreds of divisions. You can just look at the professional society, the American Psychological Association has hundred and some divisions and so on. So all these, uh, all these, the whole of social science. Is divided into hundreds of visions. That's a really, really bad idea. And when it was first suggested years ago, and I give a little bit of the history in England in the physical sciences, people objected that we shouldn't do this. And the reason you shouldn't do it, unless there's a very, very good uh, argument, the reason you shouldn't do it is it limits criticism. If yeah, you can, all the crazies can be in one group, right? And they review each other's papers, they have peer reviewed papers and so on. And so they can propagate absolute nonsense because nobody else has access to what they do. They come up with a private language, you know, and so on and so on. So that's that, that's that, that's that section. Um, and in that section, I talk about uh, some of the fruits of this uh, these disciplines like systemic racism. Uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, racial uh, credit theory critical race theory, yes. um, the uh, unbelievable nonsense in this very successful book by this um, lady. And of course, uh, uh, Abram X. Kendi's book, which I just wrote a review of actually, which is, I mean, it's Red high Red. on literary skill and propaganda. It is, in terms of logic, literally nonsense. It's literally <laughs> nonsense. And yet here it is hugely influential. So, so I read a little bit about that. And the last section is on history of science, which I've always been very interested in. There's some wonderful people who've written history of science, and there's some, some truly awful people who've written history of science because they don't even understand the science. Anyway, I think you've probably heard enough from me. I, I, I have to ask a couple more things because you um, reminded me of something. Uh, that on our last episode, I talked to Charles Nagy, of University of Central Florida, who is also a, a bit of a renegade in psychology. And uh, psychology is, um, at least to my perspective, the heart of what's called the replication crisis. Um, and I wonder if uh, you could just give us your take on what's going on with that. Uh, in other words, just for the listeners, the replication crisis is the discovery that many um, psychological studies and in other disciplines like sociology and some others, uh, but these findings that were sort of assumed to be reliable, valid findings, um, it turns out that these results cannot be reproduced when tested again. And this has kind of upset the idea of what is valid disciplinary knowledge in, in some of these disciplines. Um, so John, could you talk a bit about the replication crisis? Yeah, I, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very interesting thing because even as a kind of, I mean, as an undergraduate, the, the standard method in, in psychology, not in the kind of psychology I went into eventually, but at that time, the standard method was this, method invented by R.A. Fisher, he's a brilliant guy, British statistician. So what does this method, well, I should say one thing, I hated it from year zero. I remember, see, I, I want to understand this organism, not this group of organisms, okay? But this method, which has become totally standard, it involves taking a group, and by the way, it affects not just psychology, but uh, much of, uh, of uh, medical science, because drug experiments are all have done this way. Okay, so the standard method is take a group of people and give them one treatment, and another group can give them what's called the control treatment, the placebo or something like that. Now, why do you need a group? Why do you need a group? Well, in psychology, you need a group because you can't unlearn something. I'll, suppose you want to 
compared to, uh, to, to two methods of teaching reading. You can't train the kid with method A and then hit a reset button and then give him method B. So the idea is, well, we'll com compare groups, we'll compare groups. The problem is, of course, there are individual differences, you know, what might work for one kid may not work for others. It's completely lost in the group. Anyway, that was that, that was the basis for doing this. And it works okay if, if, if the job that you're engaged in, the work you're engaged in, is in fact equivalent to opinion poll. An opinion poll wants a group opinion. It doesn't care about individuals. It wants a group opinion. And this method is fine for that. Now, now what, did, what did Fisher use it for? Well, Fisher, as I said, is a very, very bright man. He worked at something called the Rothenstein Horticultural Station. It's an agricultural research station in England. This is in the 20s. And he was doing things like, well, we have a fertilizer. If we give the fertilizer um, to one piece of land, obviously you can't repeat that. You have to, we ought to know which one's better. We can't give one and then give the other. So he said, let's uh, uh, assign plots of land randomly. And then half of those get the fertilizer A and half of them get fertilizer B. And then we can look at the yield from these plants and there'll be variability that there'll be improvement in some, not in another big improvement, small thing. So we'll, we'll do, we'll do a, a comparison of that. And what he found was, uh, well, fertilizer A is better than fertilizer B by a little bit. That's fine. I mean, the method was brilliant. It's absolutely good for that purpose. Uh, um, and something that was not noted at the time, and as far as I, I came up with it myself, and I'm sure other people must have come up with this too. Um, there's a cost to making an error. And in Fisher's situation, the cost is small. You pick fertilizer A, and fertilizer B was really a little bit better. Big deal. You know, you, you haven't lost a lot of money, you know, it's a small mistake. But now in basic science, it's very, very different. It's very, very different. If you have a hypothesis that A is better than B or whatever, you test your hypothesis and it's significant, okay? Suppose you were wrong. Suppose you're wrong. Well, it's just science. You know, of course, there's a huge cost because people will take what you, your result as a fact and they will build on that fact and they will publish papers based on that fact. And so there's a sort of endless replicating effect of an error what's called a false positive error, error in science can have huge consequences. It can waste a lot of, uh, it, not in human lives maybe, but in terms of uh, a huge wasted effort. Anyway, the bottom line is that uh, uh, this method is not only very costly if you make mistakes, but it turns out to be unreliable because um, the, the usual standard is and I should get my lecture notes for this. The usual standard is that if by your statistical model, I emphasize that, by your statistical model, your result could only have occurred uh, by chance 5% or less of the time. That's the 5% criteria. Well, it's a complicated argument, and I, 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 I won't attempt to give it here, but one thing is absolutely obvious. Even if your statistical model is correct, and it may well not be, I mean, that's the, you need a model to get that 5%. Even if your model is not correct, even if the model is correct, still, if you keep trying, you're going to get a, a positive result one in 20 times. In other words, getting back to my own work in operant conditioning, it's what's called a variable ratio schedule, or another way to put it, it's like a one-armed bandit in a casino. You just keep trying, you're going to get a positive result, okay? And that, I think, is one of the main reasons this method is so popular. You can always get something if you just try hard enough. Effort is rewarded. Truth, not so much. <laughs> That's a great answer. So I got one last question for you. How have you retained this wonderful London accent being around Americans for 60 years? That's a very good question, especially with my wife as, as American. Um, well, I could have retained this accent, but I'll try to improve it, see? So I don't <laughs> talk quite like that. But when I first came to this country, I came to Virginia, and I found I had to actually imitate the local accent in order to get the guy at the gas pump to give me that. So, <laughs> 
So I had to say, well, hi, Molly, but they have, they have to see you. Could you give me some regular, please? And so and then they understood what I said. Huh. <laughs> but now you don't have to do that. Although today, funnily enough, <laughs> just today, this morning, I was on my walk in the local park, they're digging it up with huge machines and so on. And the devastation was so great that when I first saw it, I thought it was a tornado, it ripped up all, all the trees and so on. So I asked the chap what it was. And he was a real nice, nice guy, but he didn't understand a word I was saying. <laughs> Didn't understand what what is the cult, what is the cause of this? Why are they why are they happening like that? Then the understand. <laughs> well, I grew up on that cold lake that you were saying had very long winters, just on the other side of it. Oh uh, wow! Across the lake from Toronto, and um, I've across been the in, lake at Buffalo, or? Uh, Rochester. Rochester, oh, yeah, Rochester. Yes. Um, but I've been in the South, the American South, in South Carolina and Texas now for. 20 years and the Great Lakes accent hasn't left me yet. So no, no, no. we're very rigid as human beings. I'm sure. <laughs> <laughs> John Stadden, thank you very much for talking to us today. Uh, an illustrious career. And I hope you're right that this uh, university can be redeemed. Thank you.